Hello, and welcome to tonight's webinar. And thank you for joining Alpine Ascents on your Denali expedition. We look forward to having you all up in Alaska this spring and tonight to walk you through your expedition. So first off, thanks for today. And it, once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at climb at Alpine Ascents if you have a logistical question, or if you have a gear specific question, you can email us at gear at Alpine Ascents. So as we get going tonight, please take the time to write your name in the chat function, along with your Denali expedition and one thing you hope to learn tonight. Joining myself tonight is Paul Kubek, Julia Doyle, um, and our Alaska operations manager. Before we dive too far in, I want to um, tell you a little bit about the webinar tonight. Well, myself, my name is Jonathan Spitzer. I've been a guide with Alpine Ascents since 2006. I've led nine expeditions to Denali, and now I oversee the operations and field operations for Alpine Ascents. So I work a little bit more behind the scenes. Paul Kubek, who will be walking us through the Denali portion of the webinar, taking us through the slideshow and showing us pictures of the route and taking a deep dive in that, has led, 12, has led 13 expeditions to Denali and is an IFMJ mountain guide. Paul is also a part of the AMJ instructor team and is a senior guide for Alpine Ascents. We're very lucky to have him joining us tonight. Julia Doyle is our Alaska operations manager and she'll be overseeing the team that will be helping to launch your Alaska, operation, um, Alaska expeditions. Tonight's webinar, we're gonna be diving into some pre-trip logistics, overview of the climbing route, and then some common gear tips that Paul has found over, the, over his 13 expeditions that have worked well for him. Before we dive too far into that stuff, we'd like to show you all a short video about climbing Denali. If you're a Washington homeowner, 2022 is your last chance to go solar. In December. So we're very excited about to launch the season here at Alpine Ascents. And a couple of things we want to cover before I pass it to Paul, which is going to take a deeper dive into the route itself and answer a bunch of questions along the way. So as you get ready for the season and in the start of your climbing season, we want you to be prepared um, to, sorry, We want you to be prepared by filling out all the pre-trip paperwork. If you haven't yet, you'll need to make sure that you fill out your NPS climber registration form, which you can find on the logistics tab of the Denali homepage. If you click on logistics, the first page is gonna outline the paperwork that you must fill out prior to your expedition. Commonly questions are, is how do I find out my lead guide's name? If you click back on the overview page, on the right-hand side, it has the dates of the expeditions with your lead guide's name there. 
And if we go back to the logistics tab, it'll walk you through some of the, some of the key components to get ready up to Talkeetna. With our meeting up there, you'll need to make sure that you pre-book your taxi to get to Talkeetna, your lodging in advance, and um, which you're gonna email to Julia. Julia, would you want to take us through now the portions of what people can expect when they arrive in Talkeetna? Sure. Um, hey, everybody. It's good to see all your names popping up on the side there. Um, yeah, I oversee Alaska operations for Alpine Ascents. Um, it's a team of three, so a small team of us, um, me plus two others. Uh, a bit about me, it's my second year with Alpine Ascents, uh, second season up here in Alaska, though. I've worked closely with Alpine Ascents for close to a decade now um, down in Antarctica, um, where I work at a logistics hub. And uh, maybe we've met there if you've done any climbing in Antarctica. Um, when I'm not living in Antarctica or traveling, I base myself out of Talkeetna. Um, so I, I live here in town part of the year where um, Alpine Ascents bases its Alaska operations out of. Um, it's a great little town. Um, there's plenty of great places to stay. Um, if you are a bit about your booking, when uh, your lodging, booking of your lodging here in town, um, if you're going to choose an Airbnb and not one of the inns or hotels that are listed on the website, um, be sure to choose somewhere that says Talkeetna, not Talkeetna area. Um, it may sound like I'm stating the obvious, but um, if you book somewhere that says like Talkeetna area, big lake, it's actually going to be like an hour away um, from where our logistics hub is. So um, yeah, please pay attention to that when you're booking your accommodation here. And then, um, yeah, please let me know where you're staying. Um, once you have it booked, just shoot me an email. My email address will be in the chat area here. Um, and um, we can start a conversation. I'll confirm that I've received your info. Um, we will pick you up the morning of your trip, the first day of your trip. Um, starting at about 7.30 in the morning, your guides will um, head out in one of our two vans to come pick you up at your Airbnb or hotel or inn, what have you. Um, and they will bring you back to the hangar where the office is. Um, the gear check that morning happens in the hangar. We have our little logistics hub about um, 10 miles from downtown Talkeetna. Um, the gear hanger and the office is there. Um, it, you'll arrive at the hangar with your guide. Um, we will start to then check you in. It'll be myself plus one other operations person. Um, we will make sure that you have your vaccine card to show us um, and your negative COVID test. Uh, that's the kind of the first thing we do as soon as uh, we all get together at the, at the hangar that morning. Um, Please bring your vaccine card um, and also uh, a printout idea on your phone, just proof of a molecular COVID test taken within 72, sample taken within 72 hours of your um, arrival at the hangar that morning. Um, please make sure it is molecular and not antigen. I know we're all used to this by now, but, um, but yeah, we need that to be a PCR test, not a rapid antigen test, please. Um, yeah, so once we're done with that paperwork, um, we'll do a little meet and greet. I'll introduce myself to you again. I'll introduce who is there with me. Um, you guys will introduce yourselves, um, your guides as well. Um, you'll meet all of your guides at that time. Um, and we'll go over the schedule for the day again. Um, and then uh, we'll jump right into the gear check where your guides will go over every piece of gear with you to make sure that you have what you need um, for your climb. Uh, a note on that is that we have a small rental fleet in Alaska, um, but we do not, we are not equipped to um, rent gear there uh, generally. So uh, please do pay attention to the gear portion of your, of your preparations uh, carefully before you leave home. Um, if you do not have something that day that you need, of course, we'll do everything we can to find it for you, but uh, it may be difficult. So please keep that in mind. We have a small, small fleet up there in Talkeetna. Um, so after the gear check, um, we will uh, pack your lunch food, or you will pack your lunch food with your guides. Um, you'll bring some, you'll bring your your snack food or your lunch food with you, and then you'll supplement that with food that we have um, there in Talkeetna. 
After that, we'll do the weigh-in. So um, all of your luggage will be packed up and sorted at that time. Uh, we will weigh it and we will put it in the van, um, in the trailer of the van. A note on that is after we put those things in the trailer, um, you won't see you won't see that kit again until you're um, at base camp. So um, things that you need to use that day or in the event of a delay, you'll need to keep with you. We'll remind you of all of this, but it's just to get your um, get your planning going on how to pack. Um, we'll then go to town. We drive into town. I'll drive you to town or the other ops person that's with us that day will drive you into town. Um, we'll grab some lunch uh, at a nice little pizza spot downtown there. They have an outdoor patio. Um, pizza lunch together and then um, we head to the air taxi where we will be met by a rep from the National Park Service and you'll have your NPS briefing at that time. Um, that's at a set time, so 2.45, you know that um, we're showing up there to have that briefing. And then while you guys are chatting with the NPS representative, I'll go in and talk to the air taxi and get another weather update. Um, so they'll either tell me that, yes, we're flying, um, no, we're not flying, or we're going to stand by and continue to check weather for another, say, it could be an hour, it could be five hours. Um, usually they call off flying around 9 p.m., um, so sometimes we're on a weather hold from uh, the time of that NPS briefing until until um, that evening. So it can be a long day. That's the point. That first day can be a really uh, long day of just getting stuff together and then waiting and then hurrying up and then waiting. So um, arrive arrive rested and ready to to do that that day. Um, yeah. After the NPS briefing, um, you'll do your final kit uh sorting you know just sorting what you have in your pockets you'll change into your um mountain clothes once we get sort of a confirmation that we're likely to fly um, and you will leave your street clothes with me you can leave your valuables with me and i'll actually leave them at a um in the safe there at the air taxi so you're just um you're flying with what you need and um we will keep the rest for you in town um Yes, uh, scheduled flight, usually we try to leave around 4 p.m., weather permitting that day. Um, uh, if, um, if you don't fly, if the weather is bad and it is um, called off for the day, we'll help you find hotels. Um, we'll get all of that sorted together, so there's no need to um, prepare that yourself ahead of time. Um, in the event of a weather delay, we... Um, we will, we will help you organize lodging for that night. And then based upon what the air taxi says um, about the weather outlook for the next day, we'll make a plan for the next day and your guides will um, pick you up that following morning at whatever time we, we agree upon. So um, yeah, that's kind of that day. Um, um, I'm in touch with your guide while you're climbing, with your guides while you're climbing. Um, well, so, you know, if... Um, if anybody comes off the mountain sooner, I'm there to meet that person at the air taxi. Um, and in the same way, I'm there to meet the entire team um, when the climb is over. So um, when you fly back off the glacier, I'll be there with the van, with your valuables, with your street clothes, your sneakers, your flip flops. And um, we'll sort the tail end of your lodging at that time as well. So um, please don't book that ahead of time. Probably needless to say, we don't know when you're going to come off the glacier. Lots of variables in the meantime. So the day you fly off, we will um, sort where you stay. We'll sort your return um, taxi to Anchorage or shuttle to Anchorage at that time, if that's where you're headed. Um, yeah, and then we'll we'll say goodbye. Uh, a note also, sorry, uh, last thing here is that when you do fly off the glacier, I'll collect all your rental gear at that time. So any kit that you borrowed from Alpine Ascents, we'll just sort it out right there at the air taxi when you fly off the glacier. So keep that in mind for your um, for your kit sorting while you're on the mountain. Again, I know this is a lot of um, out of context information now. So we'll chat again in Talkeetna. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I know this is a lot of information out there. And so if you end up forgetting um, some of the key details, once again, you can reference the website with the logistics tab under meeting and transportation. You can reference the Talkeetna taxi here. Um, Julia outlined us through the lodging and you can reference all of these lodging here, questions here. Julia touched on the food that you need to bring 
Once again, we recommend 42 pieces of your favorite snack food. You can find this under the food tab. Um, many of us find a combination of our favorite energy bars, candy bars, granolas. A lot of guides and climbers really enjoy some type of hydration along the way as well, re replenishing like Scratch Labs, Gatorade, Crystal Light, Noon, something to mix up your water. Up, in, up at the hangar in Alpine Ascents, where you'll meet Julia, we've got meats, cheese, dried fruit, nuts, and starches like bagels and crackers up there. Uh, if you have questions about our COVID policies and protocols, you can always reference our COVID-19 tab right here, and you can email climb at Alpine Ascents if you have questions as well about that stuff. The last thing that we wanna to touch on before Paul overviews the route is the general idea of climbing Denali. Denali is a very strenuous mountain. Well, not necessarily technical like other peaks around the world. It is a remote expedition. We expect climbers to come fit and prepared with the proper equipment. In the, during the expedition, you'll be climbing close to 17 miles to reach the summit and around 14,000 vertical feet. Our website outlines that you're expected to carry a pack up to 85 pounds during the expedition. Hmm. Due to the nature and the remoteness of this peak, if individuals are not prepared, it can be quite challenging on an expedition of this size for people to come off the mountain. So we ask that you take the training seriously and that you come prepared to be, spend the whole time in the field. There. So with that said, I'll pass the webinar over to Paul Kubek, who's going to lead us through a slideshow of Climbing Denali. So, Paul, please take it away. Hey folks, I'm just gonna move over to screen sharing and um, pull up a slideshow of a, a few shots that I and other guides have taken while working on Denali. So. As Jonathan already mentioned, I'm an IFMGA guide, the internationally certified mountain guide. I've been working for Alpine Ascents since 2007, and along the way I've attempted Denali 13 times, 12 of which I summited, and i um, happy to be here today presenting this. Hopefully this will touch on a few different learning styles and, or give you opportunity to see photos that maybe you know, with the concept that a photo can be worth a thousand words. So I've been guiding since 2007 and on Denali for Alpine Ascents. And Denali, the name Denali is an Athabascan phrase that translates approximately to the tall one or the great one, 20,310 feet. It is, as many of you I'm sure are aware, one of the seven summits or the seven high points on the seven continents. It's the highest point in North America and it's uh, interesting and beautiful and challenge all on its own right. So um, Denali is one of three major mountains and many thousands of smaller mountains that make up the Alaska range. And the other two major ones that you may be able to see my uh, cursor pointing to are Baguya, also known as Mount Hunter, and Sultana, also known as Mount Foraker. Together that makes the father, the mother, and the child in Athabascan names. Denali is big. It's really big and it takes a great amount of preparation, planning, hard work, and a little bit of luck to summit. You gotta be good to be lucky. As Jonathan and Julia already mentioned, your expedition begins in Talkeetna, Alaska, which has an official population of a little over 1,200 people but swells to approximately 3,000 residents in the summer as all the tourist service people join the population. So there's raft guides, there's mountain guides, there's food service industry workers all joining Talkeetna. And 
It's a, it's a quaint little town that merits an extra day or two in your itinerary if you've got the time. Before your expedition begins, your guide team is going to be spending two days, one of which they'll occupy themselves with packing breakfast and dinner for 23, approximately 23 days on the mountain. And the other day in which they will be checking your group gear. So things like tents, pickets, ropes, sleds, all of those things will be double checked by your guide team after Julia and her staff have checked them. As Julia already mentioned, you'll be picked up at approximately 7.30 at your hotel or Airbnb, and you will be transported to our aircraft hangar at our logistics hub outside of Talkeet. For the next few hours after, the, after showing your COVID tests and your COVID cards, you'll be doing gear check, okay? And I can't emphasize enough to you the importance of arriving with the gear that you need to Talkeetna. As Julia already mentioned, we do have a little bit of gear at our hangar for problem solving, but there's certain items for example, your boots, that if you showed up without proper boots, it'd be show-stopping. It'd be the end of the expedition for you. We'd do everything we could to solve the problem, but ultimately, you should be starting now assembling your gear for heading to Alaska. There are supply chain difficulties, shipping takes time, I can tell you I'm headed to Alaska in the month of May, and I've already done a pre-pack of my gear for the expedition. I've got a duffel bag in the basement of my house that's got a bunch of gear that I'm not going to need between now and then packed up. And I've already gone through the Alpine Ascents I gear list. I use the same gear list to pack for these expeditions, and uh, I've made preparations for this because... Good luck trying to, uh, in the final week before your expedition, say, uh, come up with some last minute item of gear. It's tricky. I'd also just remind you that this gear is what we sometimes call PPE or personal protective equipment. The climbing gear on the Alpine Ascents gear list is Carefully thought out and selected, it is a risk management tool. And there definitely are items on that gear list that we've tried to indicate are more or less like per preference items. And there are items that are truly show-stopping. Boots, mitts, puffy jackets being an example. So after your gear check, as Julie already mentioned, you'll head to Mountain High Pizza Pie, get some lunch, and then you'll go over to the ranger station where you'll get a briefing. Briefing's mandatory. And then you'll um, prepare for your flight into the range. So you'll be loading your gear, which you can see here in the foreground behind the four-wheeler. You'll be loading your gear into one of Talkeetna Air Taxi's twin otters, or sorry, turboprop otters. And final group photo and loading up for a scenic flight into the range, as long as it's flyable that day. If it's not flyable that day, as can sometimes happen, you're in good hands and Julia and her staff will help you out. But assuming it is flyable, you can see that this group here has changed into their mountain gear and they're doing one last group photo before hopping in the plane and enjoying a scenic flight into the Alaska Ranch. Flying in small aircraft is one of the things that I love about my job. After about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes in the air, you'll land on the southeast fork of the Cahiltna Glacier at about 7,200 feet. 
You can see this group here unloading the same gear that they loaded into the Twin Otter about 45 minutes ago. Now they're working as a team to unload the gear. Sometimes, depending on weather, the pilots may want to turn the on really fast. Other times, it's more casual. Depends on the day. This day was clearly a nice day, and probably folks are feeling not that hurried. You can see in the background a sub peak that we call the aircraft control tower, and a major peak, which is called Hunter or Baguya. If you're lucky, Perhaps you'll have the opportunity to fly with Paul Roderick himself, one of the major heroes of Alaska aviation and owner of Talkeetna Air Taxi. Definitely one of the things you'll be doing that afternoon after already having gear checked and flying into the, getting briefed and flying into the range is you will be setting up your tent. It's worth noting that on our Denali expeditions, our clients are expected to help with many aspects of camp setup. This is unlike, say, Kilimanjaro or Karsten's Pyramid or Vinson. On some of our expeditions, even on Rainier, the tents have already been set up for the clients by our hardworking staff. On Denali, Due to the nature of the expedition, you will be needing to set up the tents, build wind walls, help shovel out camp. So you can see this team here working to set up one of our North Face VE25 tents. If you're lucky, you might be treated to a view of a Serac fall off of Mount Hunter or Baguya. Uh, don't worry, no clients were harmed in the taking of this photo. Camp on the southeast, the base camp on the southeast fork of the Kahiltna is far enough away from any mountains such that avalanches will simply make, or ice fall will simply make for an uh, interesting photograph uh, rather than any type of emergency. So you can see here in this route overview, You've flown into base camp at 7,200 feet. I'm gonna go over a sample itinerary. It's very important that I emphasize to you that there are multiple ways to break down this route and that based on weather and also based on guide team preferences, the group, the exact details of where you camp might vary a little bit. For example, if you follow our itinerary closely, it calls for us to use a, a 0.5 camp, which is about located here, and I certainly do use that camp. You'll fly into base camp, you'll head down Heartbreak Hill and up the Cahiltna Glacier to Camp 1. For the first couple of moves, or at least for the first move, probably for the first two moves, you'll be what we call single carrying. What does that mean, you ask? What is single carrying? Well, I'm referring to those loads that Jonathan already mentioned, the 85 pounds of kit that you'll need to be responsible for moving that may well be broken into say 40% approximately of the weight in your backpack and about 60% of the weight in a sled. And this is a photo of one of the Alpine Ascent sleds in the front of this photo where it says, let's do this. That's a um, waste carrying can called a CMC or clean mountain can. And that's what we transport all of our human waste back off the mountain. We're required to do this by permit. It's also a good leave no trace activity. It cuts down on waste on the mountain. So you can see this team sitting on, this, on the main fork of the Kahiltna with uh, one of their sleds in the foreground of the photo. This is another team leaving base camp and starting to head down Heartbreak Hill. You can see the person at the front of these 
couple of rope teams is heading downhill and they're dropping 600 feet from base camp, which again is on the southeast fork of the Kehiltna. They're dropping 600 feet down to the main Kehiltna Glacier. Of course, at the end of your expedition, and the reason it's called Heartbreak Hill is because you're gonna have to come back up those same 620 feet. This is a photo from uh, the main Kehiltna Glacier. You can see in front of this rope team, you can see Point Farine, named after a climber who died on the first expedition on the west buttress of Denali. To the right of Point Farine is what's called Ski Hill, and Camp One is at the base of Ski Hill. I don't actually know where Ski Hill gets its name. I did a little research, couldn't come up with anything, but um, it will take you one or two days to get to the base of Ski Hill and Camp One. And during that time, probably, typically, you'll be what we call single carrying. So moving slowly with all of your kit. So again, Camp One is at the base of Ski Hill. From Camp One, we'll start what we sometimes call our cash and carry system. So for the next couple of moves from Camp One and also from Camp Two, we'll be breaking up those 85 pounds that Jonathan mentioned into smaller, more succinct loads, carefully selected. So much of the food and maybe some of your kit, perhaps like, your warmest mitts and maybe your warmest jacket down low where you don't need it, you'll be transporting that up to a cache. And so what is a cache you might ask? A cache is a little storage place. We'll actually dig a hole in the glacier and we'll put those carefully selected items into a hole and then we'll cover that hole over and mark it with wands. You can see wands at the four corners of this cash hole. We'll mark it with wands and we'll take a GPS waypoint and then we'll walk back down to camp. So that you can imagine <clears throat> that this group has, this is in right now, they're carrying their sleds on their backs back to camp one. They're, these Climbers that you can see in the foreground are walking down Ski Hill at this moment, and you're looking down the Cahiltna Glacier. The southeast fork of the Cahiltna is where my uh, cursor is moving at the moment. Once you put in your cache, you'll rest. You'll gather as a group and eat a tasty meal prepared for you by your guides. These photos are some examples of the type of things that you might eat well on Denali. I think this is a good point for me to mention the difference between a true food need and a food preference. So if you truly have a food need, that would be like an allergy that would cause you to get truly sick if you ate something, please be very careful to communicate those to our staff and they will be accommodated. On the other hand, a food preference like say, I really don't like olives on my pizza. Well, it's easy for your guide staff to accommodate your food preferences well on the mountain. You might communicate it to the lead guide in advance. You can expect having some email communication from your lead guide about a month before the expedition starts, approximately. At that point, you might let them know about your food preferences. But again, something like, oh, I don't like olives on my pizza. Well, it's easy enough to either have the cook not put them on or just pick them off. So again, we're using a cash and carry system to move up the mountain. So picture we've made it to camp one, we've put a cash in wherever your guides prefer to locate it. I often locate mine right at the corner at the top of Cahiltna Pass. Gone back to camp one, 
we've rested, we've eaten food, and now we're going to move up to camp two. This is a photo from a nice day at camp two. We like days like this. The weather is not always like this on the mountain, of course. Um, we tend to take photos on the nice days. Uh, I've spent five days stuck in camp two. The place is a bit of an eddy and so it can have large snowfall. Um, but on the sunny days, we get out, we take photos, and we keep moving up the mountain. Again, from camp two, typically we're gonna put in another cache up and around Windy Corner. So this is a rope team returning to camp two. You can see camp two here kind of Below, here's the rope team heading down Motorcycle Hill, it's called, and walking back to Camp 2. If you look further down the glacier, if you follow my cursor, this is the corner where I've put in a cache, and um, the main Cahiltna Glacier runs down this way. The Mountain Sultana, or the Child, also known as Mount Foraker, is here in the background, and the Southeast Fork of the Cahiltna is way out to the left of the photo. So from camp two, having put in another cache around Windy Corner or wherever your guides chose to put it, um, we'll be going from camp two up Motorcycle Hill, up Squirrel Hill, across the Polo Fields, around Windy Corner and into camp three. This photo is from the polo fields. So again, this location on the mountain. You can see that on the polo fields, you're starting to get up to a fairly significant elevation. You're up around uh, mid 12,000 foot elevation. You can see that the mountains around Denali are starting, you're starting to be in line with the summits of those mountains and you're moving up higher on the mountain. You'll get to camp three, or sometimes referred to as 14 camp, because it's at 14,200 feet. 14 camp, camp three, can be a lovely sheltered place many days. It's south facing, it's wind protected. On a sunny day, there'll be helicopters flying and people to socialize with. You'll spend an extra rest day at this camp. It's at a really kind of sweet spot in elevation in that it's high enough that you are gaining acclimatization while still being low enough that you're also getting stronger at the same time. This is a view of Camp 3 or 14 Camp as seen from Camp 4 or 17 Camp. So you're looking down from Camp 4 onto Camp 3 right here. You can see off to the side, off to the east or the left in this photo is the Ranger Camp. And if you look further out left and follow my cursor, you can see what we refer to as the edge of the world, which occasionally um, on sunny rest days, your group might take a jaunt out to the edge of the world. It's very scenic and photographic. You'll be waiting in camp three or 14 camp for the weather to improve. Honestly, in this photo, the weather doesn't look awesome, but as I remember this day I took this photo, we had a good forecast and this was kind of the tail end of some more unsettled weather. You can see a bunch of groups leaving camp. They're gonna head up this head wall. If you can follow my cursor, um, the you'll leave 14 camp and gain almost 2,000 feet going up the head wall through the fixed lines. The fixed lines are where my cursor are. In fact, I can see a couple of people on the fixed lines as small dots in this photo. You'll go up the fixed lines and 
then you'll gain the ridge between 14 and 17. So continue to follow my cursor along this ridge. This is Washburn's thumb here. Washburn's thumb is named for Bradford and Barbara Washburn, who were two climbers who helped pioneer the first ascent of Denali's West Buttress in 1951. You'll continue past Washburn's thumb and on out to 17 Camp proper. This photo was taken from 17 Camp about where my cursor is now. So This again, this slide here again illustrates camp three and the fixed lines up the ridge to camp four or high camp at 17,200 feet. This photo is taken from the top of the fixed lines. I and my um, cohort here at the Alpine Ascents office, we asked around for photos taken on the fixed lines and um, the reason I wasn't able to come up with a photo on the fixed lines is because it's an engaging section of the route. It's a 50 degree ice slope and uh, you will be practicing the skills to travel up the fixed lines, probably on your Denali prep courses, you've already practiced these skills and you'll be reviewing those skills in 14 camp, but it's a physical, and demanding and let's just say engaging move up the fixed lines. This group is topping out the fixed lines right here. And now they're moving up the ridge. You can see Washburn's thumb that I pointed out in an earlier photo here above the climber with the red backpack. This shot is taken looking down at the same summit ridge, or sorry, the same ridge between 14 and 17. Again, this is Washburn's thumb. And you can make out a, actually a series of climbers moving along the ridge. So from camp three up to camp four or high camp. Camp four or high camp is Let's say it's not as desirable as Camp 3. Camp 3 is south-facing, relatively wind-protected. It's a great place to hang out. Camp 4 or high camp at 17,200 feet is uh, it's the best spot between 14 and the summit, but it's not that great. And it requires good wind wall building skills. So I and most guides won't leave 14 camp until I know for a fact that my group can build, can manufacture snow, snow blocks and build wind walls. So lower on the mountain, you may not always need these wind walls, but we're sometimes doing them for practice because you have to imagine you've made a really difficult move from 14 to 17 and there's no guarantee that wind walls will be available to you when you arrive. Sometimes you get lucky and you can move into somebody else's abandoned wind walls, but more often than not, you have to manufacture your own wind walls after doing a very physical move to get to this elevation. In the background of this photo, to the right of the letter I in the AAI, you can see the route continuing on up toward the summit. This section is another 40, 45 degree ice slope known as the Autobahn. And you can see people's boot tracks in this route. And if you look closer, you can actually see two rope teams ascending or descending, I can't say for sure. Given the light, I think this is an afternoon photo, so they're probably descending the Autobahn at this point. But you'll go up the Autobahn on your summit day to the northeast. You'll gain Denali Pass, and then the route bends to the right or the southeast um, and goes behind the ridge that you can see in this photo. This in the foreground is known as Fantasy Ridge. And here at the top, this is not the summit. You can't see the, the true summit of Denali 
from high camp. Sometimes you'll get to high camp and be faced with what you can see in this photo. This is what we refer to as a lenticular. Lenticulars are very clear indicators of high winds. I, can, I took this photo myself in 2019, and I can tell you that on this day, the decision-making was quite easy. That is to say, we didn't go up. This kind of weather, uh, this is dangerous weather up high, and um, sometimes you'll have to wait this weather out for as long as a week at high camp. I do my best to work with forecasting to try to not get stuck at high camp for a week, but sometimes that's how the cards fall. If you're waiting at high camp or really anywhere on the, on the route, you'll hang out inside tents, get to know your teammates better, drink hot drinks like you can see our guide Victor McNeil doing in this photo, and just enjoy your time. Rest, rehydrate, eat food. Meantime, your guys will be working as a team to get the best weather forecast, also to reinforce camp. You can, of course, help your guides reinforce camp. And you'll notice in this photo, folks wearing really good face protection in what is less than perfect weather, while I try to get an updated weather forecast on my phone. If and when the weather clears, you will leave high camp and you will head up the Autobahn. Chances are your group won't be the only group going that day, so we need to kind of jockey for position with other groups. You can see this group is headed up the Autobahn toward Denali Pass. They're launching into what should be approximately an eight-hour day to the summit and a four-hour day back down from the summit which will of course total 12 hours, meaning you're going up the Autobahn at the start of your day. The Autobahn is not insignificant. People have fallen to their death on the Autobahn. And you're gonna be coming back down the Autobahn at the end of a long and physically demanding day. So you need to have a little bit of gas in the gas tank at the end of your day. After going up the Autobahn, you'll go underneath zebra rocks. You'll go up through a long nondescript slope that will take you past Archdeacon's Tower. And then you'll go across the football field, up Pig Hill, and you'll gain the summit ridge. This shot was taken from the summit ridge. The person in orange in the foreground has just crested Pig Hill, and they're looking toward the true summit. Where my cursor is, you can see a climber there who is standing on the true summit. This shot was taken from the true summit, and now where my cursor is, they, that is back where this person in orange is standing. So again, person in orange, looking at what's approximately a half hour trip to the summit. And then they're gonna have to do a half hour back. So you may, well, I've never had to do it, but guides have certainly had to, or climbers have had to turn around from this point at the top of Pig Hill. With a lot of preparation, some hard work, and a little dash of good luck, you'll get to see this benchmark, the top of Mount Denali, sometimes known as Mount, formerly, the mountain formerly known as Mount McKinley, at 20,310 feet, the top of North America. Look for this marker. You'll take a summit photo with your team. This is my team in 2019. And the saying here is fingers or photos, you decide. You won't spend a long time on the summit if you're fortunate to make it there. You'll spend 10 minutes in poor weather, a half an hour if it's a really nice day, and then you'll start back down the mountain. I'd like to emphasize to you that the summit is only halfway on your expedition. It's probably taken you at least two weeks, maybe 20 days to get to the summit. 
it'll only take two to three days, hopefully, to get back to Talakitna. Again, it should have taken you eight hours from high camp to the summit and approximately four hours back to high camp. Maybe a little longer, but shouldn't be a lot longer. At high camp, you will rest. You will definitely eat food, even if you don't feel like it. You will drink water, you'll rehydrate, and you'll prepare for a couple more strenuous days. The next morning you'll get up, weather permitting, you'll move down at least to camp three, but quite possibly as far as camp one, or maybe even all the way back to base camp in a single push. That is very guide and weather dependent. When you get back to base camp, before you look like this guy, exhausted on his duffel bag, Julia and team will appreciate it if you separate your group gear and your rental gear from your personal gear in some sort of organized fashion. Your guides will help you facilitate this. And then you will rest for anywhere from 45 minutes to four to five days. I'm not kidding. I've waited at base camp a week after summiting and getting back to base camp. I've waited a week for a flight out. It can happen. So I can't emphasize to you enough that the, the exact ending date of your expedition is definitely an unknown. Um, purchasing tickets that allow for a maximum amount of changeability is definitely well advised. And I would also say that planning like the most important meeting of your business career for the day after your Denali expedition is scheduled to end might not be the best idea. Allow yourself some recovery time as well. With a bit of luck, you'll be picked up by one of the new school heroes of Alaska Aviation, Leanne Fallon, and you will fly out of the Alaska range. For the first time in three weeks, you'll see the color green and you'll end up back in Talkeetna. It's always nice to allow enough time to have dinner with your crew before you, before Julia and her team help you arrange for a shuttle back to Anchorage and a flight home to wherever you came from. Awesome. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to for, st stop thank, my screen share here and hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Paul, for walking us through the climb. Um, really appreciate that idea. It helps paint a better picture of what, um, what we can expect. Before we kind of dive into answering some, some um, gear tips out there that Paul's going to walk us through, I want to take and answer a few questions that have come up. Somebody asked a question about getting COVID tested in Anchorage, and I want to let you know, yes, there is testing available in Anchorage. However, at this time, the airport is no longer doing testing directly there. I'd recommend reaching out and sending Julia an email, and she can help work with you to send you information on testing available in Anchorage there prior. Okay. We understand that sometimes due to flights around the world and the way travel works, that the 72 hours might not be perfect. And we understand that. And if it happens to be a few hours over, we understand and we're willing to work with you all on that. Okay. A few other questions. Somebody asked about what kind of um, the permit that you need to fill out. Let me show that here on my screen. When you click on the tab, for in the logistics tab, it'll take you to this page here and you'll click and you'll need to fill out the special use application permit here. It walks you through the whole process of what to fill out. And then it, down here is the writable PDF that you'll take the time to fill out and you'll email it back to climb at Alpine Ascents. Once again, if you need to find your guides lead, um, the lead guide's name, you can find that on the homepage. A few other questions is, um, can we bring our own tent or do you provide ones? Alpine Ascents provides tents and we use the North Face V25. Well, it's not that light of a tent out there. 
this is our home for the next three weeks. And we want the most durable, reliable structure out there. We've been using the VE25 for expeditions around the world. Um, I've been stuck in many storms. I spent a week at high camp in a VE25 while other individuals were in other tents that got crushed by the winds um, that were over 70 miles an hour, broke down our wind walls, and the VE25 was able to hold up to that. So that's why we, we require people to use our tents. We also have a system for guiding them out in advance, so that way they're ready to be guided out in strong winds. A few other questions is, can I bring my own tent or at least up to 14K? Remember, if you start to want to bring your own tent and then move into other tents up there, while we understand people want to do that, we really um, prefer everybody to be together as that just compounds more weight on each other out there. However, if you're an individual that wants your own tent and your own privacy, we understand, we'd recommend working with your lead guide when your lead guide sends out their, their welcome email, which you'll get about three weeks prior, and you can talk them through that thought process out there. That tent will need to be an expedition four season double wall tent out there. And we'll need to make sure that that tent is properly guyed out. Another question is, is like, do we use a cook tent? The answer is, is 100%. On Denali, we have, um, we use a, what's called a floorless Hildeberg tent system. It allows all of us to get inside. The photos that Paul showed of the red, the red dining tent is inside the Hildeberg tent. It's a great way for, um, to come in there together. And we will be using the cook tents right away. And that's why we have a, our strict COVID protocols out there where people need to be vaccinated and show up with a negative PCR test out there. So with that said, we're going to bump back on over to Paul as he kind of walks us through some gear tips here. And we'll close by answering a few more questions tonight. Thanks, Jonathan. Moving over to screen sharing. So I've been asked to give a few gear tips and there are many and certainly you'll get some gear tips from your lead guide in their uh, welcome email that you'll get mentioned three weeks before, approximately three weeks before the expedition. But here's a few for you. As I already touched on gear tip number one, the most important, it's never too early to start assembling your gear. Start Immediately after this, this uh, podcast or cybercast or whatever we're calling it, start immediately afterward assembling your gear. Look through our gear list very carefully and definitely don't be hesitant to contact our gear staff. You've got their email right in this slide, gear at alpineascents.com. And... I would recommend going to them perhaps even over your guide team because these are people whose full-time job it is to answer your gear questions and they're an incredibly useful resource to you and they can nerd out on gear at a level that sometimes frankly our guide staff can't. Gear tip number two, uh, don't let your metal ice axe drain your hands of heat. Insulate it. So I put together a little photo montage of how I insulate my ice axe. Here's the axe and you'll need a piece of foam which uh, is insulate foam from a sleeping pad. You could cut it off the bottom of a foam pad that you got or maybe ask a local gear store. I've got duct tape and I've got a pair of scissors. I've measured the foam to the head of the axe. You'll notice that I've carefully left the entire ads as well as the entire pick showing. And then I've gone and duct taped the foam over the head of the axe. Neatness counts here and a few extra bonus points if you have a fun color of duct tape. But most importantly, make sure it is neat not too large and not sloppy. You want to look good. Look good, do good. Gear tip number three. There are many better ways to protect your nose than sunscreen. So um, I personally like using the Outeroo that's also you're supporting a small company up in New Hampshire. 
uh, one, one man operation. Um, but bottom line, you need to come up with a system for protecting your face. I'll go over it here in a second. I'll, once I'm done with the slides, I'll show you how I protect my face on the mountain. Uh, gear tip number four, layer your gloves for best results. I'll also go into depth on that here in a second. Gear tip number five, personal favorite, consider bringing a mini Nalgene in lieu of a mug. The advantage to the, the mini Nalgene is you have one more reliable water storage and transport tool. You might even um, either purchase a jacket for the mini Nalgene. This is a half liter Nalgene bottle. You could either purchase or make for yourself out of foam with a little extra foam after you've made your ice axe protector. You can take some of the remaining foam and duct tape and build a nice neat jacket for your mini Nalgene. And it works in many ways better than a mug. So I'm gonna drop back out of screen sharing here for a second and I'm going to show you a couple of ways that I protect my face on the mountain. First of all, on the lower mountain. So um, I'll start with the, a thin, light colored outer roux. And I'll put that on my face. Then, and again, I've probably, I should back up a step. When I wake up in the morning, I'm starting at first thing, I'm drinking half a liter of water and I'm putting on sunblock. Like before I get out of my sleeping bag, I'm doing those things. Then for traveling throughout the day, I'm gonna put on this kind of funny looking outer roof thing. I'm gonna wear a pair of glacier glasses and I'm definitely all day gonna be wearing a sun hat. I personally like a visor over a baseball cap for the added breathability. Um, and then uh, in addition to the sun hat, I'm gonna do what I call the babushka with uh, in honor of all the Ukrainian grandmothers out there. I'm gonna do the babushka, which is I'll take the um, buff and I'll use it maybe extend it out over my um, visor to kind of maximize sun protection. Because if you get sunburned, there's kind of no going back. You're not in an environment where you can recover from sunburn. And then on top of this, of course, I'm gonna be putting lip balm um, on a regular basis. Something I make sure that my lip balm has SPF of 35 or greater. I'm gonna be regularly covering my lips, if not actually using zinc for that. So again, this is on the lower mountain and you'll notice that I've emphasized light colors. I also personally prefer, as it's mentioned in our gear list, I prefer to wear a soft shell pant on the lower mountain that is also light colored, not black. Because again, you actually are dealing with a lot of UV on the lower mountain. So this is my lower mountain face protection. On the upper mountain, which I might define as above 14 camp or camp three, I'm using a slightly different system. Occasionally I'm using this system even above camp two or 11 camp. So I've got a buff and I have a outer roux that is of more of thicker, more insulative um, material. And then, and then I'm gonna go to, let me get that thing fit properly behind my ears. And then I'm gonna put on some goggles. Goggles both pr provide wind protection and they provide some warmth as well. You'll notice I'm careful not to have any gap here. And then I may put on a warm hat and that depending on conditions, this may be enough with my toque, pulling it up like this, or as conditions get even worse, and by worse, I mean windy, 
I mean cold. Um, at that point, I might move to a balaclava. Bottom line, protecting your face on the mountain is essential. If you haven't protected your face and you get windburn, it's not something that's very easy to recover from and it doesn't look good. Um, as far as hand protection, I'm... I wanna again emphasize layering. Sometimes on the lower mountain, I'll be using a soft shell glove and that will be adequate. I often like using these leather work gloves made by Kinko. Um, they're cost effective and very useful. There are many good manufacturers of soft shell gloves, um, but as conditions get colder, I'm going to be choosing for myself to always wear a liner glove. I think sometimes people forget the importance of liner gloves and they think they can just go straight into their warm gloves. But underneath the warm glove, I'm always wearing a liner glove and having an extra pair or two of the lightweight liner gloves can be really useful then I, I like for a warmer glove, the B, I think this is called the BD Guide Glove. Um, it has a removable liner that to be honest with you, I rarely if ever remove because it's difficult to put back in. But again, I'm wearing the liner glove underneath the guide glove itself. Another pro tip is as my fingers start to get cold, one thing I can do is I can actually pull my fingers out of the finger section of the glove and I can um, ball my fist up inside the, um, the expedition glove itself. However, if I start to find that I'm doing this a lot, needing to ball my hand in a fist to keep my fingers warm, well, then that's what I call a stop and fix moment. And I'm gonna switch over at that point to a mitt. The advantage of mitts, again, this is the, this is the OR Alti mitt. It also has a removable liner that is easier to deal with than the one in the gloves. And if I find that I'm having to ball my fingers into a fist inside the expedition glove, then it's probably time for me to switch over to a mitt where all my fingers can hang out together and provide warmth for one another. There do exist chemical hand warmers and those are on our gear list and they're great to have. And I certainly do use them occasionally at high camp. Remember, however, that you also come equipped with your own hand warmers that work constantly. There are hand warmers at the back of your neck and there are hand warmers in your armpits as well as other creative locations on your body. So those are just a few pro tips. I think many of the things I just told you, you would hear from pretty much any guide on the mountain. They're useful for you to hear at this point. I caught that someone was asking what the manufacturer name for these liner gloves was and I can tell you these were issued to me by the U.S. Antarctic program a couple of years ago. These are just basic wool liner gloves. There are many good manufacturers of liner gloves out there. 
Um, I, and they're, I hate to call them disposable, but they're, they don't tend to last very long. This is a particularly good pair. I think what is most important is that you, you take the time to find ones that are form fitting to your hand, not loose and baggy. They need to be um, form fitting without being constrictive in any way. So on that note, with those few thoughts, there are many, many more good tips. You can expect that your guides on your expedition will be handing out tons more useful tips, but these, we wanna prepare you in advance with some useful information through this, uh, this cybercast that we're doing here. With that, I'll kind of hand it back over to Jonathan, stop sharing my screen and, uh, yeah, over to Jonathan, who will facilitate some question and answer session. Awesome. Thank you very much, Paul. It was great to go through the gear um, and some of the tips. Um, the other kind of common liner gloves guides quite use is like the thin base layer outdoor research black liner gloves out there. They're easily, you can find them online. We sell them here at Alpine Ascent store. You can find them uh, in a lot of places out there. The key is with the liner gloves is make sure you get the correct size that you can also then fit it into your mitt or your expedition glove that Paul mentioned there. So at, towards the end of the webinar, which we are now, we're gonna take the time to answer some questions. If we don't get to your question tonight, please know you can always email us at climb at alpineascents.com. Or if it's a specific gear question, you can email us at gear at alpineascents.com. One of the questions was, is it recommended to book your flights home after we return or wait and do it later? So we would strongly recommend you book your return flight, your round trip with the departing flight out of Anchorage the day after your expedition after 1.30 p.m. If for some reason your expedition was delayed, you could, the guides on the mountain will let the, will let the office, myself and Gordon Jano know, and we will work with your family and you to adjust your flight. Okay. Another question that came up was, how does the team or group of guides define what is good and passable weather climbing on Denali? Um, Paul, do, since you've done 13 expeditions there, do you want to take that one for us? Uh, happy to. It, that's, of course, as you know, that's kind of a magical question. Um, yes, it is. And uh, the answer, the first answer I would give to that question is the one that you'll hear a lot, which is, it depends. Um, we, we are not given precise parameters to work with. We're using a number of variables. Uh, including intuition. Um, I would throw out as a number that by the time I'm starting to hear about 40 mile an hour winds, I have no interest in being up there in 40 mile an hour winds. Um, I've been up there in 40 mile an hour winds and I don't want to do it again, but I, uh, I am definitely getting weather forecasts from, there's a nightly weather forecast issued on the mountain. I rely on Jonathan for daily and Julia as well for daily weather forecasts through my in-reach satellite texting device. Those are all very helpful. Um, I'm using my years of experience and I'm also talking to my teammates, both in my immediate team and to all the other guides who are working with me around on the mountain to use uh, my best judgment to um, make a decision as to whether or not to summit, right? whether or not to move at any point. And all that said, sometimes I I definitely listen to everyone else, but I don't always do what everyone else does. I, and this year on the mountain, um, I watched all the other guided groups leave 11 camp or uh, camp two. And I looked at the weather myself. 
I watched all the other guide teams leave and I said to my group, I'm sorry, it doesn't make sense to me to go. We're going to stay. We stayed. The other groups went, turned around and came back, having been beaten back by the high winds. And that afternoon, the wind died and my group was able to cash around Windy Corner. Was that luck? Was that skill? I don't know. You got to be good to be lucky. The bottom line is it's a judgment call every day and we are not given hard and fast parameters. Rather, your guide team, ultimately um, driven by the lead guide, will make that decision on an individual basis. Safety rules everything. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, as Paul mentioned, it's a, there's a wide variety of things out there. Um, to dive a little bit more into that, we have three main factors that allow us to climb big mountains. So we have the temperature, the winds, and the visibility, and of course, precipitation. On mountains such as Mount Baker or Mount Rainier or other peaks that have lower elevation, if two or three of those factors are in the threshold, we might still climb. When we're dealing with peaks that are 6,000 meters or higher, like Denali, which is right at that threshold in the Arctic, we typically need almost all four of those weather factors to align perfectly. And the reason being is safety. When we're up on these big remote expeditions like Denali or Mount Vincent or in the Himalayas, our threshold for pushing it is narrower because of the remoteness and the more likely of cold or um, injuries out there. Um, like Paul mentioned, we do daily weather forecasting. Alpine Ascent has a paid subscription to a company that provides us with daily mountain weather. The company is out of um, Germany. They'll text Julia and I weather updates and then we hand that weather off to the guides. It's a high-end mountain weather forecast that is um, from a professional meteorologist who looks specifically at mountain weather forecasting out there using a wide variety of weather maps, not just a, a generic algorithm like a, like a mountain forecast or something like that. A couple other questions that have come up was, what is the policy on splitting up teams on the mountains if somebody or some people cannot make it to the top? Well, one of the benefits of Alpine Ascent is we run close to 16 expeditions a year. Our teams all work together. So for example, if Paul's expedition is coming down and I happen to have an individual on my team who can no longer make it up, we work together and I'll put that person on Paul's rope team for them to exit on out. If there's not another Alpine Ascent group in the proximity to coming up and down, we work with the other guided concessions on the mountain and do this quite frequently. So part of that is as your trip is coming down the mountain after you reach the summit, you might end up finding yourself grabbing an individual from an, from an Alpine Ascent trip if they need to descend as well. This is very rarely happens, but occasionally throughout the season this might. Somebody asked a, another great question is, do we need a full body like Himalayan suit? I, we do not want those on Denali. And the main reason is, is most of the expedition, it's actually quite warm. And a lot of times we just need to add the layers on. The only time it's beneficial is really on a, on a cold early season um, um, summit day. Rest of the time, you'll find yourself overheating and over sweating one, one, one with it on. It's not uncommon on the summit, you might wear your puffy pants and your down parka and all your layers for that last hour that Paul mentioned on Pig Hill. And then on your way back down, as the sun really warms on up, you have to take all of those back off. With a Himalayan suit or an 8,000 meter part, um, suit on, you can't actually quickly take those off, um, especially with the harness and being tied to the rope system. So that's why we discourage those up there on the mountain. Um, Paul, a question um, for you is, um, what's your favorite kind of mountain boot that you like for Denali? If you were to you know, embark on us, what kind of boot system you would recommend? What, what would you recommend tonight? Yeah, so... I feel pretty strongly about this, that um, the big mountain boots, the so-called 8,000 meter boots or the all-in-one boot, um, they are much more expensive. And I grant you that the cost is, you know, they, they cost at least a thousand dollars, perhaps more. Um, so the cost is significant, but ask yourself this, how much is it going to cost you if you get frostbite? 
I'm going to wager you even with a good health plan, probably more than a thousand dollars. And it's just not something you want. I like using the La Sportiva Olympus Mons. It's an 8,000 meter, um, sometimes called all in one boot. That boots worked great for me for years on the mountain. I'm not married to the company La Sportiva or sponsored by them, but I feel strongly that the 8,000 meter boot is a much better solution than um, any plastic boot with the uh, over boot on it. You will note our gear list does allow for a say plastic boot with a um, 40 below purple haze over boot on it. Um, that will work. But again, the bottom line to me is that the 8,000 meter boot, 8,000 meter style boot, whether by La Sportiva or Loa or Scarpa, or there are many manufacturers out there making this style of boot, that that is, it's the way to go. It costs more, but it is as close as you can come to a guarantee of foot health and safety. Awesome. Th thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I do the same out there. And when you break down the cost on some of the other kinds of double boots out there, you're going to need to buy the boot. You're going to need to buy a gaiter for some of them if the gaiter's not built in, and then the overboot. And that price almost ends up being the same out there. Changing subjects is somebody asked, how can our family, friends, and loved ones follow us along? Back on the website, on the Denali homepage, on the right-hand side is a tab called Cybercast. Please send that link out to your family, friends, and loved ones. The guides will be sending out a Cybercast pretty much daily. That being said, if it doesn't happen every day, please make sure your family, friends, and loved ones do not worry out there at all. Sometimes there's a delay for 36 or 40 hours because the teams are working quite hard on the mountains and the guides might be taking a break and, and uh, enjoying a bit of a midday siesta and forgetting to check in. We do our best to check in every 24 hours. In addition to that, if your family, friends, or loved ones are ever concerned, they can always email Climate Alpine Ascents, which will come to me and Gordon Jano, and, and we are in touch with the guides on a daily basis as well as we ch do um, check-ins. Um, another question was about um, cell phone service. Paul, what's the cell phone service like up there these days? Uh, none. None. Okay. So great question. So we recommend that if you're planning on wanting to be in touch with your friends, families, or loved ones out there, that you bring a two-way texting device like a DeLorme, uh, sorry, Garmin or DeLorme InReach or the Spot X out there, or you can bring your own sat phone. Another question is, how do I keep this stuff charged? Well, Luckily, being in the Alaska range, there's plenty of sunlight. You'll notice on the gear list, there's no need for a headlamp, and that's because we've got close to 24 hours of daylight all the time. So you'll be able to charge any of those two-way texting devices throughout the trip, and that way you can be in touch with, your, with, your, uh, with people along the way. Right there. Let's see. Does one of you want to make a, um, a comment to the group about Diamox, about the blanket use of Diamox? Ah, Paul, you want to take that one? Uh, it's a tricky question. Um, yeah. the, um, uh, I would say that as a rule, um, I am not using Diamox. Um, I have over the years become more acceptant of the use of Diamox. It's ultimately a personal preference thing, um, but we would encourage you generally not to be using it. Um, it, it can be added in um, if you are feeling the need for it. Um, some people do choose to take it from the get-go on their doctor's advice. And if that's the choice they're making, I'm fine with it. Um, I will occasionally take some myself after the move from 14 to 17. Um, I'm definitely aware that doctors, some doctors advise that it needs to be taken for multiple days to be effective. But my own personal experience is that it does 
work, even on a, as a small dose, whether that is um, psychoactive or whether that is, um, you know, the mind versus the body, I don't know, but it, it uh, I'm not personally taking it from the start of the expedition. Partly <laughs> I find the excessive urination to be that it provokes to be a bit of a annoyance. Um, to follow up, somebody asked a question about the solar panels again. Yeah, if you bring a solar panel, you're going to want some type of small battery cell bank for the solar to grab and fill while you're out there. As Paul outlined in, our, um, in the slideshow, we're going to be traveling up and down doing these caches and carries. And a lot of times we'll lay out the solar panels with a small battery cell then. I can charge my battery cell all day while I'm out, leaving it at the tent, come back and then charge my phone. I bring, I personally bring a Kindle and on my phone, I listen to music and podcasts throughout the, throughout the climbs out there. I yeah. recommend that. It's a great way to also, to, sorry, to charge your cameras as well. Um, it's worth, well. it's worth testing those systems in advance. Not every solar panel mates with every battery. And so it can be disappointing to take that stuff up on the mountain, try to use it for the first time and discover it doesn't work. So again, this is one more shout out for assembling your gear kit now rather than the week before the expedition, because you need to test to make sure these things are working with one another, that they all play nice together, basically. Yeah. Um, another question was about cameras out there. And we really want you to make sure that you take the time to document your trip up there. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. With that said, it's important that the camera is small. I've done a lot of climbing just like Paul around the world. And I find if I bring a very large DSLR, it ends up sitting in the bottom of my pack. So I'd recommend bringing some type of small camera that can fit in almost like a hip, hip pocket belt or in my jacket. That way I can keep it warm on the summit day and easily grab it out when my guide tells me it's okay to take a photo. There. Um, another question, is it a single carry with the sleds up the hill or do you make a couple trips? I believe this person's referencing going up to high camp and we leave the, the sleds at 14 camp or camp three. And then from there, we'll be doing a, typically a cache to 16.2 just with our backpacks, come back down and then moving all the way to high camp up there. If we misunderstood that question, please retype it in the Q&A and we can try and answer that one out there. Um, a question, any final training nutrition advice for the last three months besides what's on our website? Paul, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, you can't prepare well no i'll take that i was going to say that you can't prepare too much but you can there is such a thing as athletic injuries and i've definitely heard stories of and seen cases of folks overtraining for these things the single biggest tip i can give you is that our days are long with very low output so a workout like CrossFit, though certainly valuable to do as a supplement to what we're doing here, is not, a short high intensity workout is not going to prepare you that well for Denali. The thing that will really prepare you well are long, is long, slow distance. So multiple hours with very few breaks, um, throughout the duration of a day, ideally carrying a backpack, ideally at elevation. So like for me last weekend, I skate skied 50 miles over the course of two days. And that's the type of preparation I do when I'm not working on the mountain. You know, um, long, slow distance is what prepares you for this. The other tip I can give you is taper your training, especially in the final week of the expedition. If you haven't trained, or if you, you can't gain any more fitness in the final week, you need to take some rest. The best advice I was given before my first Denali expedition was go up there fat. And in the final week, 
eat an extra hamburger or whatever your favorite food is, plate of pasta to, you know, eat a little extra food, take some rest. Spend, you're going to be away from your, your family and loved ones for three weeks. So, you know, spend the final week before your expedition spending a little extra time with those people that are important to you in your life and getting some rest. So long, slow training in the months before your expedition and some rest and time with family and loved ones right before the expedition would be the two things I can offer you there. Awesome. Th thanks, Paul. Um, we're going to take two more questions tonight. And then once again, if you have any others, please email us or give us a call. Um, tips for if you have sweaty hands or sweaty feet. You know what? This is a problem I have personally. So I typically bring a small amount of baby powder, um, foot powder, in a little mini, um, like almost mini Nalgene, small little um, four or six ounce container. And then at night, I put that, or during the day, I'll put that in my liner boots out there. And that helps pull the moisture out of my boots at night. And um, I have that quite a bit. The other thing you can get is um, a thing called Foot Glide, which you can buy just on, you type in Foot Glide into a Google search engine. It's almost like antiperspirant for your feet. Um, you can tell it's a topic I know quite too well, but having that on my feet down on the lower mountain has helped prevent me from getting blisters. You can see Mary um, put in the chat function there um, a blog that we wrote specifically for people with sweaty feet. Um, one other question we want to address is, do we really need to have full side zip pants on out there? Paul, do you want to take that one on out there? Totally. The full side zip pants are truly important. I know we've looked at this carefully because the full side zip pants are much more expensive. Um, but the advantage that full side zip pants provide is that you can take them on and off without having to undo your harness, take off your crampons. The other thing I can say to you is not only is it important, it's highly important to bring full side zip pants, not the three quarter zip pants. It's important not just to bring those things, but I would recommend that you practice with them before the expedition. I make a point of practicing with them at 14 camp or camp three, but um, they're not as easy as you might think to take on and off. So practice with them before the expedition. Some separate at the top. Others, I think Arcteric specifically, separate at the bottom. So take the time to practice with your full side zip pants, ideally while wearing your gloves or mitts before the expedition starts. This is a valuable skill if the wind comes up really suddenly. Yes, um, somebody just asked, um, all right, what about the soft shell pants? And we're just referencing the hard shell pants and the puffy pants. And the reason being is you'll typically climb in what we call our action layers, which could be long underwear and our soft shell pants. Now as we're moving up, it gets windy. I can use the full side zips to put them on over my boots, which have crampons on them already, put them on up and we can keep climbing. Now all of a sudden it gets colder. I can to undo the full side zips on my puffy pants, put them on, and I can keep climbing on out there. So we want to thank you all very much for attending tonight's webinar. We really appreciate you all take climbing with Alpine Ascents out there. Paul, thank you so much for walking us through the Denali and what to expect. Love all the slides. Brings back some wonderful memories. Julia, we look forward to seeing you up in Talkeetna and meeting your whole staff up there. Once again, if you have any questions, please email us at Climate Alpine Ascents if it's logistics or gear at Alpine Ascents if you have gear specific questions and you can always give us a call. Thank you very much and have a great evening. As Paul said, start, start fine tuning all that gear and reach out if we can help. Thank you again.